Bueno, todo lo que se ha dicho esta tarde, yo creo que hay, eh, hay, hay motivos, hay razones para que nos interesen a todos lo que aquí se ha dicho. Perdonad porque me estoy quedando cada vez con menos voz. Sí, parece que haya, se animan. Gracias. Thank you, all three of you, for your papers this afternoon. They were spectacular. Um, I'm especially interested in asking um, Sheila Folia and Sheila Barker um, what they think about why there are these moments, like there is right now, of shows and auctions that are focused on women. It doesn't seem to me to be a particularly wonderful moment in the world for women. So I think, it, you know, is that the reason or has that always been the case that there are these fluctuations that are coming from the social and political status of women? Thoughts? <laughs> well, you can even start. I'll just, I'll, I, I will, should I speak in it, it, uh, Italian or English? For English? For English? Ah, uh, okay. I, I can only answer the question uh, in regard to exhibitions in the United States. And I've been <coughs> thinking about the gossip and the backstories that I've been hearing. There are some important exhibitions on women artists in the United States coming up. And in those cases, it's been the museum director that has pushed the idea on a curator, oh. not, not the curator. And I think that the, um, the boards of directors are finally getting the message that old-fashioned museums are not interesting to contemporary audiences. They're trying to find ways to make museums interesting to people and relevant. And one of the ways is to make them reflect contemporary political concerns. So I think that um, in many cases they're trying to not just anticipate what uh, society needs or what the art world needs, but I think they're looking at how to sell more tickets. And I think they're finally realizing that women artists are interesting because we don't know a lot about them and it seems novel. That's one's possible answer. Don't you think the market just is gonna respond to whatever kind of can happen? And I don't really know the background of that Sotheby's show, but they must have gotten a critical mass of works that they could group together you know, and present it that way. And the star of that show was an, Eliz um, an Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun that went for something like eight or 12, I mean, a huge, a huge amount, so. Um, but I think also, I mean, I suppose to a certain extent, it was no different in the Renaissance. It helped a lot if you had a promoter. You know, there's a show on now at the Uffizi about Pietro Aretino, who promoted various artists and himself. Um, so now, if brands, you know, luxury brands, they're sort of aligning themselves, and I think there's an assumption that women of fashion might be interested to see works by women. Who knows, but that would be my guess. If I could just yeah, jump in for a second with one comment, you know, the press drives a lot of what we perceive to be actually happening or changing. And sometimes things are going on that are perhaps not as well publicized. And I'm thinking of uh, the work that Vera Fortunati has done in Bologna, where there have been a series of uh, conferences and exhibitions for many years. Yeah. Uh, devoted to women artists, and I was uh, fortunate enough to participate in one of those projects with her in 2004, so before it seemed like it was really getting cool to have exhibitions of women artists. 
Vera spearheaded an exhibition on Elisabetta Serrani in which both Angela Gerardi and I um, contributed. And it was a phenomenon in Bologna. I'd honestly never been to an opening like that. It was the most thrilling moment of my adult life. 1,500 people showed up in Bologna for the opening of the exhibition. They had to turn people away. I had a friend who had driven in from Florence who had to fight his way <laughs> to the exhibition, um, saying, you know, come on, let me in. I mean, so I'm not saying there isn't more going on now. I do think there is, but I also think that there have been uh, some real leaders, such as Professor Fortunati, who have done a lot that has gone sort of under noticed and appreciated for many years. just to say, I absolutely agree that the scholarship has been there. It just seems to me we have these sort of interesting, you know, if we don't think about art history as being in its own little bubble, there are some pretty compelling political and social reasons sure. why things come in and out of fashion on a, you know, in, in the public more than just in our scholarly bubble. It just seems to me a sort of a moment of resistance even that we're pushing. Mm -hmm you know, as, as we're able to now, um, in American museums in particular, I suppose. Um, some time ago, the National Museum of Women in the Arts mounted a show of women artists from the Hermitage collection. And the then director of the museum, who was not in the field at all, because it was all 18th century, a few 17th and 16th, she said, oh, how are we gonna market a portrait show? So genre kind of comes into it too, maybe. Thank you for such um, wonderful and informative talks. My question is a general one and um, both um, Sheila Barker and Sheila Foliot went back to Linda Nochlin. One of the things that uh, Nochlin encouraged us to do was to try to look at women artists perhaps from an institutional perspective. So trying to step back. And I know um, there are archival challenges, for example, um, Sheila looking, working on Garzoni or um, Sofonisba, any of the women artists, there are often archival challenges. And then I contrast that with um, Professor Bond's approach to uh, women in Bologna more generally. So I was wondering if perhaps uh, I'd be very interested in your thoughts and the very different approaches that we can take um, when studying women artists. Well, I don't want you to be misled. I did a lot of archival research. Um, so, I mean, I don't think yes, one can entirely work on women artists uh, without you know, especially women artists who are not already well studied without doing a considerable amount of archival research. And it's not always obvious how to approach the problem of what do you look for and how do you do research in the archives when you're working on women. I mean, um, I've talked to a number of uh, scholars who have had a similar experience, like Carolyn Murphy working years ago on Lavinia Fontana. Uh, in fact, that um, you know, you don't find all the records of the commissions or things that one might uh, be more successful in uncovering for a major male figure. Yes, absolutely. And perhaps <laughs> before we hear from the others, I only wish to clarify for everybody: when I talk about um, archival problems, it is just that, which is more <laughs> often than not, you oh. cannot simply enter a woman's name into a city archive and get any kind of meaningful result. So you end up with a little bit of information, which perhaps may not be sufficient for a monograph or for a full exploration of a woman's artist. So mm -hmm. I was really thinking about that in the different approaches, whether to do a single um, artist show or a book that collects perhaps more of a, of a sample right. of a population. Right. 
Well, and I think, oh, if, if I, uh, just one other quick okay. thing I was gonna say. One thing that really influences um, the possibilities in Bologna is what Professor Fortunati was talking about, the presence of the university, which among many other impacts that it had, um, really created um, an atmosphere of scholarship and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts that were never published in Bologna. Many of them were some in the, from the 16th and 17th century, but an increasing number by the 18th century that provide a wealth of information about many subjects, including women artists. And I don't think I could possibly have come up with a list of 68 artists were it not uh, for having spent time uh, working on those manuscripts. So that is I, my impression, something that is singular to Bologna because of the academic climate of this large, old, venerable, and distinguished uh, university. So lots of things can factor in. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, Sheila Barker is the example of, that I'm most familiar with of where you found things relating to Artemisia Gentileschi in, I don't know, street addresses or, uh, I mean, just, you know, whatever, right? I mean, kind of unexpected places. Yeah. Sí, bueno, <coughs> yo lamento no hablar en inglés. Eh, quería decir que he disfrutado muchísimo con las tres eh, conferencias. No sé si me están traduciendo. Sí. No, no, ¿Sí? Más. ¿Se comprende? Sí, bueno. Comprende. <risa> eh, yo llevo cinco años dirigiendo un proyecto aquí en la Universidad Complutense de Madrid sobre mujeres eh, protagonistas de las artes, no solamente artistas, sino también mecenas. Y, y bueno, veo que en parte se puede pensar que es una moda que ha surgido al calor de muchos estudios. Yo creo que no que no es una moda, que es el resultado de muchos años de estudios y que ahora, por suerte, eh, lo que tenemos es, eh, como se ha visto también en las tres eh, conferencias, una enorme diversidad en cuanto a la forma de afrontar los estudios sobre eh, mujeres artistas. Es decir, que no solamente las academias, eh, sino también eh, la presencia de las, el papel de las mujeres en los talleres artísticos Creo que es fundamental, eh, se ha mencionado algo en relación con, eh, con Bolonia y la singularidad de Bolonia. Eh, también en relación con, con el rastro documental que dejan las mujeres, efectivamente las mujeres tienen una situación jurídica a lo largo de la historia que condiciona el rastro documental. Creo que eh, se trata de mirar con ojos distintos lo que muchas veces hemos visto ya, porque... El papel de las mujeres no solamente está en la formación, en el taller o en el desempeño del trabajo como artistas. Muchas veces el papel que, que desempeñan en la intendencia del taller es fundamental y eso nos obliga a mirar con otros ojos. Respecto a los géneros artísticos, creo que también es un problema más historiográfico que histórico. No digo que históricamente no existiera pero también nos va a obligar a revisar el papel de los pintores, eh, porque eh, los géneros, en el caso de Fe de Galicia, no se ha discutido en el caso de Caraballo, estricto contemporáneo con su cesto de, de flores y frutas, se discutió el papel de Fe de Galicia, magnífica bodegonista, pero no solo magnífica artista y magnífica pintora. Quiero decir que yo les agradezco mucho eh, sus tres conferencias, <risa> porque realmente ha sido muy revelador de cómo eh, un tema que lleva tiempo, pero no tanto tiempo, necesita seguir siendo revisado y necesita seguir siendo investigado en los archivos con otra mirada, volviendo a mirar los documentos con otros ojos y extrayendo eh, noticias que antes no podíamos extraer porque no sabíamos mirar, quizá. Muchas gracias. Um, I, I have an anecdote that will um, maybe expand on the idea of the importance of continuing what we're doing. It's often been said that Artemisia Gentileschi 
And this also goes back to the other comment about the, the challenges of doing archival research on women artists. It's often been said that Artemisia Gentileschi was the first woman to join the, or to be admitted to the Academia del Diseño in Florence. And um, I wanted to study her, and instead of just um, accepting this as a fact, I went to the archival book and, and looked at the record. And I, I've worked with the record, and there are many interesting things that I discovered as a result of looking at the context very carefully. But then I did something unex, unexplainable. I didn't take for granted that she was the first. So I went earlier in the book, and I found other women artists before her. She's not the first. I went uh, just two pages back and found that, well, she is first admitted in 1616. In 1604, there is a woman who enters as a puppet maker. <laughs> now, I thought to myself, it's, the world is not going to change radically its ideas about admitting women into the Academia de Diseño because of a puppet maker, even if she is bravissima. It's not going to be a puppet maker. So I knew I had to keep going back further. And it's just this. We've been told what women artists have done, but we also need to not believe everything that we read. We have to be a little suspicious and to challenge the received history, to challenge the historiography. And the only way to do that is in the archive because um, you can argue an attribution forever and you might not um, convince the world conclusively, but if you also have archival information, then history really can um, can change. So I, I, I'm really glad that um, this is a concerted effort, an international one. It needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good story. They probably want to get us out of here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentations from, from this afternoon. Um, well, it might be, less, this probably is a topic for an, an entire different conference or another one, but anyway, what uh, it, it probably is time to um, get beyond a narrative, an art historical narrative based only on quality, greatness. Uh, it might be worth debating whether it's actually needed to leave it, leave it away or to get beyond it. But anyway, what other kinds of narratives what other kinds of uh, yeah, stories do you think that we might be telling in the next five, 10, 15 years, thinking of graduate students, thinking of research projects? What can you foresee as alternatives? I, I don't think it's, it should be substitutes, but definitely alternatives. Thank you. I mean, for me, one of the greatest uh, contributions of the last 25 years has been what we've learned about convent culture, what goes on inside of convents. And there are a lot of artists in convents. I mean, there, but like the Plotilla Nelly show, it has to be presented and interpreted because you're, you're not going to get the kinds of things that people are used to seeing. But what some convent artists did was invent different iconographies that involved women more in stories. Uh, you know, that, that's one possible thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I thought about a lot uh, in working on my book that um, is coming out soon was about what networks of women mm -hmm. Uh, could signify and how they haven't, that whole notion hasn't really been used in art history in relationship to women artists. It has, for example, with great success 
in studying women writers um, in various periods and cultures, but not so much, I think, for women artists. And I um, think the kind of what that encourages is to think, uh, I mean, for, uh, for me to think of not just Elisabetta Serrani in relationship to other painters, but what about the women writers and the religious figures who were women who also influenced her in the city. She lived around the corner uh, from Caterina Vigri's uh, convent of the Corpus Domini. And, you know, so one can always, it's sort of the opposite of working with documents. It's more just casting a wider net and thinking more broadly about women in different cultural situations and what, w were they aware of each other and how might that have influenced them? And I, for me, that was a really important um, component of my approach to examining women artists. And I think often because so many studies of women artists in our period are monographic, dealing with one or perhaps one or two women artists, I think that often limits um, the possibilities for thinking more broadly and in terms of networks of women from various cultural sectors. So for me, that would be a possible area to think about. Your show, your, your premise for the Giovanna Garzoni, oh, yeah. that's a new narrative. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, my um, opinion is very, or the things that excite me are precisely the things that Babette has just mentioned. Uh, I came across this 1620 manuscript about women artists that was mentioned in Babette's talk. And one of the yeah. most extraordinary passages, 1620 Florence, was the description of Chinese women artists. 1620, and part of that description was about how in the court of Felipe Primo, right? Felipe Primo. Felipe, el rey Felipe in Spain. Oh, segundo. Felipe segundo, segundo. segundo. Yeah. yeah. In the court of Felipe segundo, a drawing by a Chinese woman artist was given to the king and he greatly admired it. Now, I went and checked on the source of the story, and the source of the story um, is just doesn't it say whether it's a work of art by a male Chinese artist or a female Chinese artist. So I don't know what the truth is in the court of Felipe II, but what I'm excited about is that in Florence in the 17th century, they were aware of women artists all over Europe and also all over the world. There is a growing women's consciousness of their place in history and their ability to enter the historical narrative. And with all of the self-portraiture of Sofonisba and Lavinia, we realize that these women are, are very conscious of their own ability to craft their place in this history and so I think the study of networks, the study of women's awareness of mm -hmm. each other's um, activities mm -hmm. will open our minds to a different level of uh, understanding of what was going on in that period. Mi autoproclamo rappresentante del pubblico mm -hmm. per eh, ringraziare di cuore, immagino che siano finite le domande forse, ringraziare di, di cuore... Non ho capito. E, e quindi? Non c'è un traduttore. Ah, posso parlare da... It's better in English, no, in italiano. Okay. Niente, volevo ringraziare a nome del, di noi partecipanti e del pubblico 
eh, Letizia Ruiz che eroicamente sì. pur stando male è stata qui in questi due giorni organizzando un convegno di grande qualità in cui c'è stato credo di poterlo dire un bellissimo clima e anche eh, la, Paloma Malaga per la sua insostituibile presenza e la sua gentilezza. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos, incluyendo, como antes sugería Silo Foliot, a nuestros traductores, que realmente han hecho un gran trabajo. Thank you, audience. Thank you, audience. Eh, y han estado pendientes de, de todos los detalles. La verdad es que han sido a los técnicos, por supuesto, me recuerda bien Málaga, que es Paloma Málaga, que siempre está atenta a todos, a los técnicos que han hecho posible que todo funcione bien. Realmente ha sido un placer, un gusto. La exposición ya se termina, ya ha servido, eh, a mí personalmente me ha servido para muchas cosas, para hacer una reflexión y yo creo que cuando eh, Jorge Sebastián preguntaba que, qué es lo próximo en torno a los… Yo creo que ya el pensar en, eh, dentro de la historia del arte, los propios profesores en la universidad, pensar en que había algunas mujeres ya me parece algo fundamental. Yo en los años en los que estudié en la universidad nadie me contó nada de una sola mujer y lo peor de eso es que yo no me hice ninguna pregunta. Eh, transité por ese vacío con una naturalidad que ahora ya mayor me deja perpleja. No me hice ninguna pregunta y eso ya me parece realmente negativo, ¿no? el, el pensar que ese vacío existía de forma natural, ya el pensar que eso no era así es muy importante. A mí estos días me ha gustado recordar que una de las primeras mujeres que se liga al Museo del Prado, casi con la fundación del mismo, es una eh, doradora, eh, María Jiménez, que una vez muerto su marido eh, pide a la dirección del Museo del Prado seguir abasteciendo de marcos y hacer dorados para el Museo del Prado porque tiene hijos que mantener y ella estaba en el taller de su marido y sabía hacer su trabajo. Como ella, muchísimas mujeres en la historia del arte han pasado, ya no que las podamos recuperar en los inventarios, en los archivos, sencillamente no estaban porque no se esperaba que estuvieran en ningún sitio. Y realmente ya el poder pensar en que hubo mujeres y seguramente hubo muchísimas más de las que pensamos, pero eh, ese vacío ha sido generalizado. Eh, nos congratulamos de que cada vez estemos pensando más en ello, que sea un éxito la próxima exposición, en este caso comisariada por Sila Baker. Y eh, nada más, les agradezco a todos ustedes su participación y ánimo. Vamos a seguir pensando en femenino, eh, que va a ser muy positivo. Gracias.